saxophone special techniques. And these are techniques that we have to be able to do on the saxophone to do all the jazz band things that we have that we're called on to do. <clears throat> so the first one there, as you notice, is getting the fat sound. Now, uh, Sam, you were playing with a really nice sound. You know, a small sound. But in the jazz band, of course, that's not going to ever work. Yeah. power to be able to play lead alto, for example, on top of that section, the whole sax section. Yeah. So we, we, we move to these mouthpieces, but there's more to it. If you're playing high in the pitch range, we've talked about this on the clarinet. now. This is way too high. Uh, I really appreciated a clinic that I saw one time uh, with Oleg. Uh, at a North American Saxophone Alliance conference, and he, here was a student who came in and played Stella. It's a college student, and he played. <laughs> Oleg said, no, no, play everything five cents flatter. <laughs> now play another five cents flatter. Dimension returns if I go too far. Now I've got saggy, flabby stuff. It's not usable stuff. But really, we're kind of walking the line of how close can I get to that saggy stuff without going there. <laughs> I want to. I want to play as deep in the pitch as I can without actually going to that flabby sound. That's where the sound opens up and really sings. You can hear the difference on the overcome content is different. Everything about it because I'm playing deep in the pitch. Now, what do I do if that makes me flat to the band? Push in. Push in. Right. Very so you, you yeah. just have your saxophone section tune using that kind of tone to begin to tune that way. You have to work with them on this because it's a, it's a problem. Even here in a college master class, I had a student that came in a little while back playing the, you don't, I don't know, it's a, my one and only love. I need a plan. So now, Steve. That's where it sings, and it's down into the pitch quite a ways. Now, this is actually also true for your trumpet section and your trombone section. I uh, had some success with trumpet players who I could finally get their attention enough to blow down in the sound like that, and the sound just goes, wow, fat as can be. And, uh, and other trumpet players, I talked to them about it, and I can't seem to get through to them. But uh, if you, you have to blow down in the pitch to get the sound. Yes? Is this also applicable to concert band, or do you not blow down in the pitch uh, in the concert No, band? well, we, we, we still have to blow on that lower range, but we don't blow down and gut it the same way I'm doing here because I've done. Sorry, I don't have the right equipment on to do that. But play classically right now for a minute. I got to be able to still. I'm still blowing in a lower position, but I'm not going to be powering it so much. So. In the jazz band, we got to we got to compete with all those brass players, and we have to be able to power it quite a bit. So this is one way that you can help your students get a bigger sound, and it will help the intonation in the section a lot because a lot of the intonation problems we face are the ones from playing too high in the pitch spectrum and then the instrument doesn't respond to that and it seems like all the intervals are out of tune with each other but you blow down like that the intervals are in tune with each other I don't have to adjust every time I move my fingers and things start to line up then we got a fighting chance of playing in tune with the section <laughs> so it's, it's a, something you have to work at it and if you've read my article it was uh, in their handouts about intonation. I've asked you to read it about this, I think, the fourth time, so hopefully you've read it. But, uh, if you've read that, then you know what I'm talking about, that you have to blow down, and it's a constant problem with the kids out in the schools. It will really help you a lot if you get this. Yeah. So when you're thinking about playing a little flat, is it um, your air stream, or is it also like you're using the armature? To, like if you the armature is very round, so it's not pinched this way. It's open, but it's really firm from the side so that it's very focused still. But it is more open because I'm going to put a lot more air through it. 
so it has to have that opening. If I'm trying to get this much air through a teeny opening, it's not going to go very well. I do have to open up a little bit. But it's mostly what's happening in my oral cavity with my tongue positioning and the way I'm directing the air into the instrument. <laughs> Completely different sound that I find. <laughs> Try to play strong with that setting. Doesn't work very well. So I think somebody asked something like this, but um, the other, the non-example you're using is how you play in concert a setting. Like that is the way to play. The no, not necessarily. Not exactly. It's it's more how I play if I'm too clarinet influenced. Okay. <laughs> Where I'm, so you still want to be I'm fast too clear, out. and I have students I have to correct. Even at the college level, they're playing with that flat chin from the clarinet. Really thins things out. Got the more uh, spongy lower lip. So yes. Does it always have to be loud? <laughs> no. But, it's the only way to play jazz. But when you're playing the big sounds, you've got to be able. You got to have some power as a saxophone player. <laughs> We were set up in a recording session some years ago at LA East, and the, 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 instead of having the typical block set up in the jazz band where the trumpets are in the back and the trumpets in the middle and the saxophones in the front, they didn't want the trumpets bleeding in the saxophone mics. And so they put the saxophones in the back, and then the trombones, and then the trumpets on the front row for the recording. It was quite interesting. And after a couple of minutes, the trombone player was like, God, you guys are loud! You made us do it. <laughs> We have to go for equipment that will help and let us do that. We can play with it. Uh, let's go on. Uh, vibrato, we've talked about already, done in the jaw. Uh, in the jazz field, we don't vibrato all the time for mainstream playing. If I'm playing classical, there's vibrato on almost all the long notes. But if I'm playing the jazz thing, right in the end of one long note at the end of the phrase. And no vibrato on most notes. But the last note of the phrase often gets a little touch of vibrato, but not until the end of the note. And classical vibrato starts right at the front of the note. Right away. But just on the end of the note. We call it a terminal vibrato. <laughs> not that it'll kill you, but it's uh, only on the termination of the note. Uh, <clears throat> Alright, subtone. This is kind of an older style, it doesn't happen in their most modern styles, but uh, if I'm playing upstairs, from about G down, I'm going to do what we call subtoning. Here's real tone. Subtone. You're hearing the difference, yeah. When do you use subtone? And generally, that's going to get used for when you play that low uh, as a soloist. And the problem is that a lot of times your second tenor player in your saxophone section is playing quite low on the instrument, so I mean, you might want to play subtone. He'll never be able to balance the section if he's subtone. He needs to play with the real tone in the section. But in the solo, he could play with the subtone. Yes? So what are you doing to make that subtone? Just Get the subtone. Higher? I'm pulling the jaw back a little bit. Now, if I pull the jaw back a little bit and leave it the same pressure, what's going to happen? I'm going to cut the reed or choke the reed off, right? So I pull back a little bit, and then I also loosen just a little bit so that I can still have the reed vibrate and not choke it off. Watch my jaw if you can see it. I pull back a little bit. I'm open a little bit more. So is that now like a flat chin kind of? Or no? Is it no, not really. Does it look like flat chin? I don't know, at least from here. Yeah, it's not really going to the flat chin. Flat chin. I would be pulling the chin down like that, like the clarinet. It doesn't work well at all because what's that doing when I do that on the clarinet? It's speeding the reed up. Do I want the reed to vibrate that fast on this instrument? No. How about when I'm that low on this instrument? Ah, oh, even worse. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we call subtone. And sometimes in a 
The mouse chart will actually say subtone over the notes. Yeah. And it's usually this kind of a background line where the saxes are going. <laughs> Take all the edge off the sound, just have that mellow sound. It may say subtone. Well, don't Sometimes you have like having a mute like on your instrument. Kind of. Kind of. Okay. Yeah, kind of like a mute. Um, also, uh, you may see in a jazz shirt written NV, which means no vibrato. Mm -hmm. And the rule is that we never vibrato in unison. I, sh I should have pointed that out uh, on number two here, but. Uh, we don't vibrato when we're in unison because vibrato in unison sounds like intonation problems. Hmm. Now, what about when we're playing the jazz in the concert band? Yeah, now we vibrato just like the flutes and oboes and everything else where we're vibratoing. But in the jazz band, if it's a unison line, we typically do not vibrato. <laughs> uh, let's look at this doo wah effect. Do wah is accomplished this way. It's actually a dynamic effect. I want the do to be soft or kind of choked, smothered a little bit, and I want the wah to suddenly be wide open. So it's kind of like this. Can you hear do wah? Do wah. Now, how do I get do wah? Again, if I pull the jaw back, it muffles the tone. Watch. pull the jaw back on the do, forward on the wah. So da, 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 do, 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 ah. we always use these syllables to try to indicate how we speak the language. This really is a, another language. It's a matter of pulling the jaw back and then forward. I hear young kids pull the jaw back and then down and then forward and then up, which is scooping. <laughs> Stuff like that. Okay. Immature sounding. You don't want that sound. Uh, <clears throat> when I'm talking to my college kids, I call that high school scooping. When I'm talking to my high school kids, I call it junior high school scooping. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the mature sound. It's the mature sound. Yeah. Funny scoopy things in there. That's not part of the doo wah. The doo wah is actually not a pitch bending effect. It's a dynamic effect. It starts from very soft to very loud. Is there a little pitch thing in there? Well, yes, because wah is indicating that there's a wah, some kind of a little pitch flange in there. But what's causing it? When I play so, from when I play soft to loud, my dynamic. Uh, when I change dynamics widely like that, my pitch also changes. And normally we try to compensate for that so that it doesn't change. But in the du wah, we don't have time to compensate, nor do we want to. And so we get a little pitch aberration that comes as a result of the sudden dynamic shift, but I never think about it as a pitch thing. I think about it as a dynamic thing. Uh, half tongue effects, yeah. So is the du just a subtone? Is the what? Is the du a subtone? Du. It kind of is in a way, yeah. I don't think of it as playing subtone, but in a way it's done the same way as a subtone, where we pull the jaw back, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the half tongue effect. Uh, I talk to my students about what I call the four degrees of tonguing. And what this is is four degrees of pressure from the tongue to the reed when I'm stopping a note. So in the first degree, zero. I'm not using my tongue to stop the note. Now I'm going to go to the next possible, least possible degree. Now my tongue is on the reed, but it's touching it so lightly that it's only muffling it, it's not actually stopping it. That's what we call half tonguing or the end tongue. Doesn't it like buzz your tongue? Uh, and when you first do it, it might tickle your tongue. And you kind of get used to how to do it. So it, feels like, it feels like licking a D battery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but more, it's like more electric That's a good than image, a battery. Yeah. I didn't bother me that way now, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah. And <laughs> I can so use, you that. use that for dynamics? I can, yes, I'm actually, I'm actually going to use that some for dynamic contrast when I'm playing a bebop line. Uh, the lowest note of a contour, if you, if you draw a contour for how the note shapes are going, 
The lowest note of the contour is typically what we call ghosted. And when I ghost, check out in this situation. So you got two top notes. The note in between is the lower note. I want it to be softer. Ghosting simply means the note is softer. Then the notes around it. And I'm doing that with the end tongue. Instead of going, trying to go with my air. My air is the whole time. And it's the tongue that's doing that. So the tongue is creating a dynamic effect. All right. Here's a Charlie Parker lip. Well, how do I get those top? Now, the other opposite of this is the top notes of the contours should pop out. They should be accented. So do you hear this? I've got certain notes that are popping. That's what really pops the melody out. And so I'm actually half tonguing notes just before those. Check. I'm going to do it in slow motion. And by half tonguing the notes just before the pop note, it really pops. <laughs> uh, shakes. How are shakes different than trills? And they look like squiggly lines over the notes like this. Shakes are wider than trills, typically. A trill is normally a second, either a half step or a whole step, a minor second or a major second. A shake is typically a third. More often than not, a minor third, but if it's not, if it's not reasonable on the instrument, then a major third. Because brass players can't actually try. And it's imitating what brass players do, what they call lip slurs, and they do shakes with the lips between partials. Right? Is that what you do on the trombone? I found that out like two weeks ago. I thought you literally just shook the instrument. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And so we're imitating that. There are very few uh, places on the saxophone that are easy to do where I can actually do a real shake, but this would be one. <laughs> I'm doing that. Oh, that's really shaky. I'm doing that like a brass player would do it. Because I'm, I'm using kind of a multiphonic type fingering. Oh. With my mouth, I'm playing two different pitches. Huh. But see, that's one of the few places I can do that in this one. Although if you're Don Menzo, you can do it on almost any note. <laughs> but uh, let's say I had to do it here. I don't have a special way to do this. So I'm going to leave down, remember the articulated G-sharp key? I'm going to leave that down and play an F to A flat. So it's a minor third. Now to make it sound like it's a shake, I'm going to actually kind of mishmash my embouchure around so it kind of smears the pitch a little bit. So it sounds like the other one, but if I just finger it this way, it's too clean. It doesn't sound like a shake. <laughs> and shakes aren't too fast. They tend to be roughly, we don't measure these really, but they tend to be roughly the speed of triplets in the tempo that you're playing in. <laughs> they also change a little bit with style. Uh, the, like a slow swing thing is the shake's going to be pretty uh, wide and not too fast and obvious. If you're doing a shake in a really fast thing, it might be faster and, you know, narrower. So it can go faster. That's what a shake is. I'm going to show you some examples of all this and I just want to get through this. Falls and doits. We have to be able to fall off of a note. There's a great Phil Wood solo, uh, Life in the Showboat. That went tune it's on. This is written with a squiggly line going down off the note. But see, what I don't want is, I don't want it to sound like fingers. <laughs> so how do I get it to smear so it doesn't just sound like fingers? <laughs> it's, it's, it's the trick of blowing low. Remember this exercise we talked about? I'm actually going to use that kind of technique to play my fall. Watch, watch slow motion. I've already gone a long ways down before my fingers get in the action. And then I keep blowing at that low level so that it smears. <laughs> then my fingers take the path of least resistance and go just as quickly as possible. I never do hard fingering when I'm doing that. It doesn't matter what key you're in, you don't have to follow the key of the piece. You just play the path of least resistance with your fingers where you can move them quickly.
and I'm going to make the, the fall is a diminuendo. You shouldn't hear the last note. If you hear, we're talking about this with synthesis last time with the doits. You shouldn't hear the top note. It should be a diminuendo. So where that ended, this should be in your imagination. <laughs> doits are just the opposite. It's like falling up. Use these effects sometimes. Wait, so do you use high air for a toy? What's that? Do you play on the upper? Yeah. No, I still blow toy? below. If I'm in a, if I'm in a Dwight from this note, <laughs> I actually start blowing it lower than it really is, and I'm blowing lower the whole time so that it smears everything together. <laughs> so that's an interesting art. The Dwight is also a diminuendo. You shouldn't hear the end of it. I don't want to hear the end. So it's kind of in your imagination, like you say. There's a lot of things in my imagination about that. <laughs> oh boy, sorry to evoke, sorry to evoke those images. For no, you. not that kind of imagination. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Bends, number eight. When we're bending something. Bending is done as a, a, a lot of it is in the oral cavity, but some of it's in the embouchure as well, where I can loosen and tighten a little bit, lipping, and some of it is in the fingers. If I'm going to bend an A, let's say, I might finger a G sharp, but maybe I don't push the buttons all the way down tight, so it's easier to kind of smear it. Because I don't want it to sound like a gray sound. I don't want it to sound like. So it's a little slower and it's a little more smeared. <laughs> That's what a bend is like. It's really written, usually written with just a little scoopy looking thing into the note. Into the note bend. And then glisses are fingered effects. This is where I connect two notes with a gliss. And I normally finger all the chromatic notes in the scale, unless it's really wide. If it's small, I'm going to finger every chromatic note. <laughs> That'd be a gliss. Uh, if it's wide gliss, sorry, that's not what I'm going to do. Uh, a gliss. Uh, I've got a gliss down. I can't really finger every chromatic note down. I usually often try to get a little chromaticism right as I'm going into the goal note so it sounds like I got there really smooth. <laughs> but you have to kind of again take the path of least resistance if it's a wide thing like that. <clears throat> now I want to illustrate those effects on the next pages a little bit. Uh, if you were to look at, oh, oh by the way, let me just point out, example one is really just to indicate what it might look like on a jazz chart when you have to double, and we skipped doubling a minute ago, but there's two measures rest change to flute. <laughs> this is on a saxophone part. This is the kind of thing you see quite often or change to clamp. Can't even be changed to oboe. All right, example two. This is just to show you what it looks like when you see these notes and it says subtone. You see the little subtone under the notes. Uh, example three, I already played for you. That's that Charlie Parker thing where I'm using the end tongue on the lower notes of the contours. Now you're looking at it, I'll play it one more time. for you also, which shows the doo-wah. The doo-wah is written right at the end of the line. And you notice how I wrote that, that I often use the brass notation of the plus sign and the circle to indicate the doo-wah. What does it mean on the brass instrument when you write a plus sign? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stick your bell, stick your hand in the bell, could be a plunger, but stick your hand in the bell and close up the bell a little bit. And then when you see the O, open that up. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And so I, I actually use that brass notation 
for, for myself, for saxophones, when I want to indicate a doo wah because it's just shorthand. Mm -hmm. But it's not indicated in, in actual music. It's usually not indicated. You have to, like, you have to decipher what is that doo wah. And a doo wah is an upbeat note tied to a longer note value than itself. Mm. Which I wrote underneath that so you can see it's actually a tie. Sometimes you see it in the sky's way with dots written as a dotted note, but the dotted note, tie, dots and ties do the same thing, rhythmically. And so it could have been written as a tie with two eighth notes tied to a quarter, instead of an eighth note going to a dotted quarter. Be the same exact issue. And so, I want the do to be softer and the water to be louder. So you um, said it's, is it, it's notated as slurred into the next note that's longer? And we do a slur there. Uh, we normally can never slur to an upbeat in jazz. We have to tongue every upbeat. If we do slurring, we tongue the upbeat, slur the downbeat, tongue the upbeat, slur the downbeat. We never slur downbeat to upbeat, except in the doo wah. This is an exception where I can, I'm going to go doo wah, and I'm going to slur it. Once in a while, I have a lead trumpet player that'll say to me, "Man, that partial is tricky, and I don't think I can slur it." Okay, fine, tongue it, but just tongue it doo doo light, and give me the dynamic, and it'll still come out like doo wah. Sorry, say that again. Do do. Um, you can't. Sometimes a high lead trumpet part, it might be difficult to do that as an actual slur. No, but you slur. In which case, I would just slur into upbeats in jazz. Oh, you never slur principle. into upbeats. Now, see, Trom Sam's a trombone player. Trombone players never slur anyway. They always tongue every note. <laughs> but you have to imitate this sound that the saxophones and the trumpets do, where it sounds like you tongue the upbeat and slur the downbeat. Even though you're tonguing all the notes lightly, there are a few. This is a whole. See, if you're not in the jazz pedagogy class, this is a whole other topic. This whole articulation thing, and you really should avail yourself of that sometime. In my new book that was published last Wednesday, uh, I have a whole about a 20-page chapter on all this stuff that would really show you a lot of examples. Okay. Uh, let's look at number example number five here. This is from a Count Basie type chart. So I am tonguing all those those TP looking accents are dots. I'm going dot, do dot, do da, do dot. By the way, I didn't get through the four degrees of tonguing. I only went to degree number two. Degree number four is that one. Maximum pressure of the tongue against the reed to stop the knot. So I go from zero to N is the least possible pressure of the tongue on the reed to D, which is a little more pressure, it will actually stop the reed from vibrating, but it doesn't smash it off, to, to the fourth degree where it actually smashes it off. And it cuts off any kind of roundedness on the end. We don't want the round sound, we want square notes. It's not. That would be the wrong sound for the swing stuff. You need to know about this kind of stuff, but I, I can't get into it all here. <laughs> Between the shake 
the trill would be that it doesn't say like TR. In yeah, it doesn't say TR. Uh, and once in a while it will say TR, and then you got to evaluate: does he really mean drill, or does he really want to shave? <laughs> Uh, and usually, it's not the case here where this is really like it looks like a drill. It should look, it should be wider. The, the way the shape ought to be written is wider, but you can't depend on notation. Uh, okay, look at example number six. One. <laughs> see this stuff in an actual chart and all the effects that we've been talking about. Hopefully that at least, at least opens the, the door a little bit yeah, to realizing, oh, there is stuff I should find out about. <laughs> 